Hi and uh, welcome to our second class in computational finance. In this second class um, we are going to start with our discussion of chapter 2 which is on the portfolio theory of Markowitz and related to that because you often need this from time to time in finance and also economics in general um, how to solve a system of linear equations and this is all related to in the end optimization portfolio optimization um, so we'll be discussing this in more detail later on when we talk about the capital asset pricing model and optimization uh, in chapter three um, but now we will be uh, turning to the introduction um, and the basics of uh, portfolio theory first um, so um, that's what I just mentioned um, here in the introduction um, portfolio theory is our topic for today um, and uh, what is portfolio theory because I'm not sure if everyone has taken the class on investment management with Professor Schumacher um, portfolio theory is about how to spread your investment across different assets and different asset classes so to um, maximize return and minimize risk and ideally get a maximum return for a set risk, uh, set amount of risk, or um, for a given amount of return, minimize your risk exposure. So this is what every investor is trying to do. But in this case, we are trying to mix different assets and different investment classes. Um, so to get an even better mix than just putting all of your money in one uh, investment. Um, so that's um, portfolio theory. Um, it will then turn over to uh, portfolio optimization and as you can already see from this word optimal and optimization um, we need methods uh, from mathematics from numerical analysis and more precisely from operations research here um, to um, do portfolio optimization um, to get the best mixture of assets in our portfolio um, and this is what we'll be looking at today um, it um, shouldn't be left unsaid that this whole theory was uh, founded by Harry Markowitz that's why we start with the classical portfolio theory of Markowitz okay so that's chapter 2.2 let's see what um, Markowitz portfolio theory is all about. Uh, you can read about this in this book, Albrecht Maurer Investment and Risiko Management. This one is in German, you don't need this, but if you're interested in portfolio theory, you can get uh, a description and a discussion of portfolio theory in basically any finance uh, textbook. This is just one um, of the books uh, this lecture is based on. Okay, so we'll start by first setting up our base model for the investigation of portfolios in terms of Markowitz's uh, portfolio theory. So we have N financial securities, could be stock one, stock two, stock three, up to N. Could also be bonds, could be any other different uh, type of financial security. Um, these securities are characterized by their returns over a period of time as defined below. So return RI is equal to um, the quote, the price of the um, of the stock, for example, at point one, plus the dividend minus the initial price, KI0, divided by KI0. In other words, this is simply the uh, discrete return. You take the difference in the prices divided by the initial price, uh, and you get the discrete return so we're not working not yet working with continuous returns here but simply uh, the discrete one um, we will neglect dividends in the following um, obviously for an investor dividend payments would be of interest but here we simply assume that dividends um, should be the zero for some companies this is true um, and obviously the price in t equal to zero is known beforehand okay now, the investors in our base model, they only look at two things. They look at risk and return. And risk and return of our investments are operationalized by, first of all, the expected return and volatility. Volatility, as you probably know, is the standard deviation, um, the um, square root of um, variance. So we are simply taking expected value and variance or equally um, 
and equivalently um, the variance or standard deviation or volatility. We call it volatility if we are talking about the standard deviation and the variance of the return. Now, if two assets have the same variance or the same volatility of the respective returns, then an investor will obviously choose the investment that has a higher expected return. So if the rate of, no, if the level of risk is the same for two investments, we will choose the investment that has a higher expected return. Now, vice versa, if we are looking at two investments that give you the same expected return, we will be choosing the one that has a lower variance, a lower volatility, thus a lower standard deviation of returns. Now, um, we assume that the securities on the market can be divided as needed. Trading these securities causes no transaction costs and we make the market perfect. We make it a very simple model in the start and we assume that we can trade uh, without transaction costs and we can trade one and a half, uh, two thirds of a stock. It doesn't matter so they can be divided as needed. It makes it much more easier later on um, for the optimization because it doesn't involve a discrete optimization. Um, now the starting point for the following ideas on portfolio theory is that the risk of a portfolio of securities must always be less than or equal to the sum of all individual risks. Why is that? The sum of all the individual risks should be an upper bound for overall portfolio risk. Why? Well, if you have two investors, the first one buys stock A, the second one buys stock B, we would assume that both have level A and level B amount of risk. And if we simply add it up, um, then that should be the highest upper bound for portfolio risk. If we now combine those two assets, we would simply assume that something takes place that we call later on diversification um, that reduces overall risk because there is some interplay between those two assets. It might be that if stock A goes up, stock B goes down, and so these ups and downs will cancel each other out, and we get what we call diversification. Um, so we, first of all, have naive diversification, which is uh, shown here. Naive diversification is the idea of saying, well, I have 10 assets. Simply divide all your money into 10 different bins of equal size. So for example, if you have 10,000 euros, simply say 1,000 euro in asset A, 1,000 in asset B, 1,000 in asset C, and so on, and you're done. That is naive diversification. It can be good, uh, but we can do much better. But how can we do much better? Well, we have to look at um, how the risk of the portfolio comes about. And this is where we are looking for correlations. We'll later on see why we need correlations. But at this point, it's no big surprise that correlations uh, and correlation factor, which measures uh, the linear dependence between two random variables, linear correlations play a large role in determining the amount of diversification we can actually achieve in a portfolio. And that's what we're looking for, correlations. Now, the mark of its diversification, and this is uh, relying on correlations and relying on a statistical model rather than just doing naive diversification, it implies that usual um, useful combination of single investments can reduce the risk so we are able to reduce the volatility of the portfolio return in a way that it is lower than the risk of the single investment. So we can actually move beyond the risk of a given single investment. And this is um, what we are looking for, diversification. And as we are going to find out, we can see that by combining usual assets like stocks, a complete reduction of risk to zero is usually not possible. If we are including derivatives, well, that's clear if you have a stock and you have a stock option and it's uh, it matches in a sense, then the risk will be zero. But if you take two or three stocks, usually you will not be able to do a perfect hedge to reduce risk to zero. However, on the other hand, we are able to reduce portfolio risk considerably. And we will consider on the following pages two securities. We'll start out with two securities. Um, that's actually quite sufficient. L later on, we can use three and even more, but two will just do fine for um, exposition. And this is 
one idea, we have an investment A, we have an investment B, and if you have perfect positive correlation, um, you can see that actually uh, it is able, um, we are able to to move the portfolio somewhere in between. Um, obviously, we will st still see the same ups and downs in A and B uh, in the portfolio, but that's just because we have perfect positive correlation, so correlation factor is 1. Let's see what happens with the perfect negative correlation. Actually, if stock C um, goes, actually this blue line goes down at the start, stock D goes up, and these ups and downs will cancel each other out. And as you can see, we get a pretty good uh, and pretty smooth line um, with our portfolio, where you can see that we are reducing the variability and thus the, uh, no, the volatility of the returns over time. And if we have not perfect or um, a correlation somewhere between plus and minus one, we can see that we have investment E, we have investment F, and the portfolio will uh, move something like this. So it depends on what the correlation looks like, and um, then we can try to exploit this. So for a more analytical discussion of Markowitz's portfolio theory, we look at the returns R1 and R2 of two securities. Share of security 1 in the portfolio is given by X. We don't need a second share or weight um, in the portfolio because if we assume uh, that we have a certain amount of money, we can simply say, okay, I can invest 30% in the first stock, then it's clear I can invest 70% in the second stock if we do not allow a lending. Okay. So 1 minus x is the weight of security 2 in the portfolio. And we need the expected value and the variance or volatility of the single and portfolio returns, the single investments in the portfolio. So mu i is the expected return for security i. Sigma i squared is sigma squared ri. Mu pf is simply the expected return of the portfolio and sigma uh, squared pf is um, the variance of the portfolio return. And last but not least, we need the correlation. And the correlation between the two individual returns is simply a uh, row of R1 and R2. So that's the correlation factor. Now, the value and thus also the return of the portfolio is linearly dependent on the individual values of the portfolio components. And more precisely, we have the portfolio return RPF equals X times the return for security 1 plus 1 minus x times the return of, pot, um, of investment 2. The expected value, uh, the average, is a linear operator. Uh, and thus, if you assume that R1, let's wait like this, if R1 and R2 are random variables, then the um, expected value of RPF, which is also a random value uh, variable, is simply given by x mu 1 plus 1 minus x mu 2. Then for the variance, um, this is actually quite simple here. Uh, this is simply um, the result of the expected value being a linear operator and um, you simply have to um, substitute R1 by mu1 and R2 by mu2. Now for the variance, it is a little bit more tricky. Now, if we have several random variables and we are looking at a linear combination of these random variables, as we are doing here, this is a linear combination, xR1 plus one minus xR2, then uh, the variance of A0 plus A1 x tilde plus A2 y tilde is, this is a result from statistics, a1 squared sigma 2x plus a2 squared sigma 2 mm, uh, epsilon plus a1 a2 mm, row of x and y sigma 1 sigma 2. So you need a1 and a2. Uh, you need the variances of the um, two constituent random variables and you need the correlation factor or alternatively the covariance which is simply given here as you can see. Oh, this is covariance. Okay. Um, and actually, I'm not so quite sure. I think it has to be 2A1A2 two, two A2, uh, covariance. Mm -hmm. As you can see this down here. We have x2 squared sigma 1 squared plus 1 minus x squared 
x2 squared plus 2x1 minus x, that is 2a1, a2, and then rho sigma 1 and sigma 2. So this is a typo here. We need 2 in front of the a1, a2. That's the variance of the portfolio return. Now, as you can see, um, the variance of stock 1 and stock 2 enter our equation for the portfolio returns variance, but also um, correlation here, rho. And because correlation enters the equation for the definition for the portfolio's um, variance, that's why we additionally need correlation between the two stocks to assess the overall risk of the portfolio. So let's start. What is the set of the possible return risk profiles in case of Markowitz portfolio theory? Uh, in this case, uh, you can see that we have the two security case um, and we are looking at all the different uh, possible combinations of mu pf and sigma pf. Mu pf, the portfolio expected return is x mu 1 plus 1 minus x mu 2 and the portfolio variance is given by x squared sigma 1 squared plus 1 and so on and so on and how does this look like? We'll see this later on for different um, types uh, and different uh, values for the correlation. So let's look at this space m of possible portfolios for selected correlations. Um, first of all, for row equal to one. For row equal to one, um, you get simply insert one, uh, sigma two plus sigma one minus sigma two x. And if you solve for um, mu, uh, mu two plus and so on and so on. And what you can see from this um, definition, maybe you can see this, maybe you don't. Uh, the set M describes a straight line with the mu sigma values of both individual securities as endpoints. So you can simply extend this. Um, and if you are able to invest more than just 100% of your money, that is, if you can take up a loan from a bank, for example, then uh, you can also extend this line. Um, and this is shown here. You have stock A and you have stock B. And if you, or one and two, if you combine these two uh, with a straight line, then you get the space of possible return risk profiles for perfect positive correlation. Okay. Now, as a second special case, we have row equal to zero. So in this case, the two stocks are uncorrelated. For this, the portfolio volatility looks like this. You again have to insert row equal to zero and you get sigma one squared plus sigma two squared x squared minus two x sigma two squared plus sigma two squared. Next, we want to see um, if we can, for row equal to zero, if we can um, um, calculate the minimum variance portfolio, in short MVP. The minimum variance portfolio is the portfolio that reduces for a given set of stocks the portfolio variance to a minimum. It doesn't need to be zero, but it's the minimal variance. So what we need to do is we need to look for x the weight in our portfolio for stock one, then we would have the weight for stock two. And if we um, take the variance and we are interested in the minimum variance, well, you know from school, then we have to take this equation, take the first derivative, set the first derivative equal to zero to find the minimum of this function. So we're doing this here. We've taken the portfolio variance, calculate the first derivative, set it to equal to zero, and then this gives us the minimum variance portfolio and the weight of stock one in the minimum variance portfolio, which is sigma two squared divided by sigma one squared plus sigma two squared. Now, note that x has to be between zero and one for two stochastic returns, and we can then go on. If we're interested in the exact value of the minimum portfolio variance, um, minimum variance portfolio needs to be switched. Um, we can simply plug in x star in the previous equation um, of um, sigma uh, 2 sigma squared pf. The result is then the variance of the minimum variance portfolio. And this one is sigma 1 squared sigma 2 squared divided by sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2. And moreover, uh, we can see that actually the volatility of the minimum variance portfolio 
is equal to, well, simply take the square root of this, sigma 1 times sigma 2 divided by the square root of sigma 1, um, sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared. This is smaller than sigma 1 times sigma 2 divided by the square root of sigma 2 squared. Why is that? Actually, um, if you divide by this square root and you simply leave out this, then anything that is on the right side where you have left this out is larger, is truly larger. And then you can see, well, okay, this is sigma 2 divided by the square root of sigma 2 squared and this gives us sigma 1. And you can do the same actually for sigma 2. So in other words, we've shown that the variance or volatility of the minimum variance portfolio is always lower and smaller than the variance or volatility of stock 1 and the volatility of stock 2. So in spite of a correlation of 0, even though one would think that we do not get any correlation, I uh, know any diversification because we have a correlation of 0, there is nothing going on and they are unrelated linearly, um, we can still see that in spite of a correlation of 0, there is a diversification effect if we are looking at the minimum variance portfolio. Okay, so that's quite interesting. For the special case row of 0, uh, we now calculate the sample space M. We've seen that for poor, uh, perfect positive correlation, it's a straight line from stock 1 to stock 2. For the special case row of 0, we calculate the sample space M that is a functional is expression for mu depending on sigma for the portfolio. Now, we have to calculate a little bit. We see we have um, the, um, the portfolio expected return. Uh, we know the um, minimum variance portfolio, um, and if we combine this, um, actually you can s rearrange this slightly um, and just a bit. And last but not least, um, you get the following. So the final result is x, the weight of stock 1 in the um, portfolios in case of rho equal to 0, equals this and if you now plug in the previous equation for mu pf, this results again, we need this here. We are interested in the expected return of the portfolio. We get actually an expression where we have the minimum variance portfolio plus or minus uh, this huge expression. And we do not care much about this. But what is interesting to see is that the graph, the plot of this sample space, space sorry, is the right arm of a hyperbole with mu sigma values of both individual securities as endpoints. So it looks like this. We have two endpoints and it looks like this. Or it looks like this. So we have a hyperbole and that's what we get. Now if the restriction 0 smaller or equal than x smaller or equal than 1 is neglected, we can get more combinations on the hyperbole beyond the endpoints. So you can actually go beyond this and beyond this endpoint. Um, but usually we will restrict x to be between 0 and 1. Okay, so this is the plot. You can see we have stock 1 and stock 2. In the original case for correlation equal to 1, we got a straight line from 1 to 2. Now we get a hyperbole or the arm of a hyperbole. And obviously at this point here, where we get the point that is farthest to the left, this is because we have risk on the x-axis, we get minimum variance portfolio at this point. This is uh, the farthest point left of the hyperbole. Okay. Now, for the special case, rho of equal to, uh, equal to minus 1. So perfect negative correlation. We do the very same. We uh, calculate the portfolio variance. We calculate the minimum variance portfolio, in which case x is equal to sigma 2 divided by sigma 1 plus sigma 2. And uh, we see that actually, um, in this case, we can diversify uh, portfolio risk completely. So we get a perfect hatch. Portfolio risk, given by the volatility of the portfolio return, is equal to zero. So that's one result here. And 
we started out with a straight line. I hope it's more or less straight here. Yes. Okay. We got hyperbolds as we uh, decreased correlation. And if we decrease it just enough, you get actually a tri more or less a triangle with the minimum variance portfolio having a, um, a variance and volatility of zero. So you can actually get a free lunch in the sense that you have a positive um, expected return uh, with risk zero. So that's the case of perfect negative correlation, correlation being equal to minus one. In practice, we will never find this. Expect maybe for some derivatives, but then it will cost you. Um, but this is the idea that um, the space of potential risk return profiles of all potential portfolios is on a straight line or on a hyperbole or at least on this um, part of a triangle. Okay. Now, finally, we deal with this case of non perfectly correlated securities. So if rho is somewhere between minus one and plus one, the minimum variance portfolio is then given by uh, again take. Um, the equation for the portfolio return um, variance and volatility. Um, take the first derivative, set the first derivative equal to zero, and then solve for x. And as you can see, you get the minimum variance portfolio with this uh, formula. Okay. Hmm. Quite simple, actually. You have only one variable. Um, you take the first derivative, and then you have to rearrange for x which isn't that complicated because it only is here, here, and here, and it, it takes a little bit of, uh, of uh, algebra. Okay. Um, no, sorry. Um, yeah, okay. Um, up to this point, we have only talked about the two security case. Uh, now let's um, focus on the end securities case. So we are not looking at just two securities, two stocks, but we are looking at 10, 20, uh, 30 securities maybe. So the Markowitz diversification for end securities is our next topic. The portfolio return is simply given by the weighted sum of all the different returns. So xi times ri plus x2 times r2 and so on with different weights. Now we are not using n minus one weights, but we say, okay, with n securities, we take n weights. So x1 is uh, um, xi, sorry, xi has to be larger or equal to zero. And if you sum up all those xi's, it has to equate one. As the portfolio return, again, is a linear combination of a finite, it's still a finite number of random variables, that is the individual returns. The expected value and variance or volatility are also given uh, by these equations. This is just the generalization of the formula we had before for the expected value and the variance or volatility of a linear combination in random variables. Now you can see we still have the sum of xi squared, sigma i squared, but now we need all those two x1, x2 covariance plus 2, x1, x3 covariance and so on and so on. And because um, the covariance between i and j is equal to the covariance between j and i, um, this is uh, a sum that only moves uh, through the index like this. 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, 5, 3, 4, 3, 5, 4, 5 and you're done. So that's how this sum has to be read. Now, basically, again, we can do naive diversification. Naive diversification would mean we take um, our n securities. Um, we have uh, the simple, what we also call the one over n rule. You simply divide your investment into all these n um, securities naively. Uh, with the same amount of money. Now let's have a look at what happens with naive diversification and we can see that yes it is a good start but it's not as good as it could be uh, when it comes um, um, when it comes to um, the um, the Markowitz portfolio um, optimizational theory. So for the analysis of naive divers diversification, we look at the following average quantities. Um, first of all, we take um, the average individual 
variant, sigma i squared. This is what we denote with v bar. And then we take um, the um, basically uh, also um, the average uh, of the covariance um, and let's see what happens. So we have the average covariance and the average variance. And the variance of a naively diversified portfolio is given by, um, so we know that we in x1, x2, x3, all those x's, all those weights, um, they are um, 1 over m. And this gives us this equation here for the variance. It's simply the sum of from 1 to n, 1 over n squared, sigma i squared, plus, and then this sum, 1 over n, 1 over n, covariance, and so on. And this is why we defined uh, the average variance and the average covariance in this particular way. Because here you can now see that what you get is 1 over n, here at the end, let me highlight this, for you, uh, you get 1 over n times average variance minus more or less average covariance plus the average covariance. Okay, we don't really know at this point if this is good or bad, but let's see what happens in the next uh, case. Now the variance volatility of the naively diversified portfolio is a function of average variance and the covariance of the individual securities. And we can also see that for increasing n, the first term of the variance, if we go back, this one here, this term, if we increase n to infinity, we have to say this is to zero for n uh, write this down better uh, if n goes to infinity okay because then this will become increasingly small and what we are left with is average covariance so this is the result in a nutshell um, if you naively diversify your portfolio that is increase the number of securities n in your portfolio more and more what you get is um, and what you're left with is still average covariance. You cannot naively diversify your portfolio to a risk of zero. It will always be uh, at the average covariance. Um, and this is, in a sense, the systematic risk of the market. Because if you take all the stocks in the market, you can see that uh, you, can, you cannot diversify um, risk at all, or not, not at all, altogether to zero. Um, but you're left with the systematic risk, the systematic covariance structure of the market. If, of course, all covariances are zero, then yes, you can do a perfect hedge, but usually that's not the case in practice. Okay, so this is the base model for portfolio theory by Markowitz. Now next, let's turn to Markowitz efficiency, which means we are looking at those portfolios that are better some, than some others that are more efficient. Now, in connection with portfolio theory, we know uh, that we want to find out which portfolios are better, and we call them efficient in a certain sense. Um, Markowitz efficiency means that if you take expected value and variance as your two measures of risk and return, or rather return and risk, um, you would say that if you have two investments and they have the same risk, then you would prefer the investment with a higher expected return. And vice versa, if both investments have the same risk, uh, no, the same return, you would pr uh, choose the investment with a lower risk. That's how we define Markowitz efficiency. It's also sometimes called mu sigma efficiency um, because we are looking at the expected value and variance or volatility. In case of two securities, the efficient edge or frontier, if it's in the um, um, uh, Grenze, uh, efficient frontier of the optimal portfolios, is geometrically given by the upper branch of the space of possibilities. And we can see this in the plots much, much better. Now, if, for example, uh, A and B are combined, we can say, well, uh, we should only be looking at these portfolios. Why? 
uh, C and B the same. Why? Because it's clear that if you take, for example, a stock combination here, a portfolio, this one is dominated uh, here. This one is dominated by the portfolio above. So for any point on this lower half, we call them actually an eggshell, a Markowitz eggshell, Eierschale. Um, if you take any um, spot, any um, combination of securities on the lower half of the frontier, then you can see that uh, this is actually dominated by this one here above. And thus you are left with the efficient frontier, which is the upper half of this frontier. And also what happens is if you have three uh, stocks, it might be that you're not starting at C uh, and going to B, but actually it could be that uh, the frontier is moved a little bit further to the left. So that's Markowitz efficiency. Now, more formally, the portfolios of the efficient frontier, they can also be um, determined uh, as following. For a given constant expected return, the variance volatility of the portfolio is minimized. Therefore, our secondary condition, condition is that the portfolio expected return is set to R bar and again that all those weights add up to one. And if we now take um, the minimization of the, uh, of the variance, portfolio variance, this can be done with the uh, Lagrange method, uh, this Lagrange Optimierungsverfahren. I'm not looking at this here. In practice, uh, we often have even more restrictions. What you do is you have a limit on your budget. You cannot invest too much money. You cannot take up too high loans. Uh, you might have internal limitations that your company says, okay, you cannot invest too much into this asset class or this asset class. Sometimes you also have external reasons. For example, insurance companies are not allowed legally to invest in certain asset um, classes. So the efficient edge, the efficient frontier of the space of possibilities shows an intuitively plausible principle. Risk and return um, stand in a positive functional relation to each other. If you move up higher on this uh, edge, you get higher return, but you have to accept higher risk and so on and so on. That's why it will never go down because this wouldn't make sense. So we, you will start here and it will go up like this. Might be at some point you were only taking up more risk for a small incremental increase um, in return, but risk and return are related positively to each other. And from the determination of the efficient edge, we can tell that numerous questions of portfolio theory are usually mathematically solved by uh, constraint uh, optimization methods. Why constraint? Because we have constraints, um, uh, in other words, Nebenbedingung uh, in German. Uh, we have constraints in the sense that uh, you cannot invest too much, uh, you cannot invest everything into one asset class, you have to, uh, you have an upper bound for your investment in a different asset class, um, maybe you have different risk measures that you need to keep an eye out for, and so on. And later on in the lecture, we'll discuss different uh, convex and non-convex optimization methods. Um, but here, uh, I think you can see that we need optimization methods um, for uh, portfolio optimization. That's clear. Okay. Now, this is Markowitz portfolio theory in a nutshell. Um, it is uh, Markowitz efficiency. And next, I want to talk about the numerical solution of linear uh, um, systems and linear systems of linear equations, more precisely. Um, because this is a helpful tool uh, you need um, all the time. You've probably seen some of these methods in school, um, but we need this all the time, sometimes in in uh, steps in between uh, in larger calculations. Okay. Now, we need to solve a system of linear equations, and we, subs uh, we um, abbreviate this with SLE, system of linear equations. A system of linear equation usually looks like this. You have a matrix A, times a vector x, that's your solution, equals a vector b, b1, b2, and so on. And we have n variables, you can see this here, we have n variables, and we have m um, equations. 
So this is an n times uh, m system of linear equations. So far, so good. Mm. Actually, um, I have to admit that there are few fields of applications for SLEs in practice. Um, there are some uh, some some applications actually in um, supply chain management when you need large, very large systems of linear equations. Um, but here in finance, we usually um, see those um, linear equations pop up somewhere in between, for example, in option pricing theory. Um, if you dig deeper into some methods in option pricing, you certainly see that you need to solve a system of linear equations numerically. And in that case, you need to do this efficiently. You need to do this with a usually small error and in an acceptable amount of time. So we first need to think about um, errors. And we do this by looking at so-called matrix norms uh, and looking at the condition number. If you remember the first lecture, we talked about the condition of a mathematical problem, die Konditionierung in German, oder die Konditionszahl, the condition number sigma being um, the absolute error between f of x and f of the disturbed input data x bar divided by the true solution with the true data f of x has to be smaller or equal than sigma times the relative error in your input data x minus x bar um, with a norm for example in absolute values this is the absolute error in your input data and um, if you now divide it by x again you get the relative input data error. So what it, this means is the condition number of this problem for f, it means that um, let's say a small error in your input data is amplified in this mathematical problem. And we want to calculate the condition number, we need this, but we need this for a matrix. This is for a function, this is for a real number x, but we need this for a matrix, so we have to define matrix norms. A matrix norm, we start with a real vector x. A vector norm is a function uh, on the set of real vectors, n-dimensional vectors, into the real numbers, for which we have the following characteristics fulfilled. Uh, the um, norm of x is larger than zero for every vector that is not, the, uh, is not zero, and the norm is zero for x equal to zero. If we have a constant c, you can uh, take it out of the norm of c times x, and we have a triangular equation, in equation, sorry, um, the norm of x plus z, uh, y is smaller or equal to the norm of x plus the norm of y. What this means is a vector, if you have a vector that is not the zero vector, then the length of this vector has to be, a norm is basically a length, um, mm, it has, to, it has to be larger than zero. Mm. If you uh, multiply it with a constant, well, if you take the vector times two, uh, then the length is doubled. And if you go, for example, from here to here, um, and you have two vectors, x and y, um, and you actually, oh, sorry, I have to move this, okay. So this is x and this is y. The triangular um, inequation simply says that if you now add x to y, if you first go to x and then to y, then it has to be a larger length then simply going from this point to this point directly. That's why it's called a triangular inequation. It's always best to go straight to your uh, goal and not go via a triangle. Well, that's quite clear. So that's a, no a vector norm. And using a vector norm, um, we can um, now define some examples. For example, the LP norms. Um, LP norms are defined as uh, x, norm or the p norm of x is equal as defined as uh, the uh, 1 over p um, um, no actually the p square root of the sum of um, all those um, uh, 
um, entries in the vector xi, uh, taking as an absolute value and then um, taken to the pth power. So for some examples, for example, the L1 norm is simply the sum of all absolute values, absolute entries in the vector. The L2, what we call, so call this Euclidean norm, the L2 norm is the square root of the sum of squared um, um, norm uh, vector entries. And not surprisingly, the L2 norm is also highly related to regression analysis. This is actually the norm you are using in statistics in uh, ordinary least squares. You can see if you minimize this, you see this is the least, this is, it's an error term. Yeah? You take the error uh, of xi, you're um, trying to minimize um, the residuals in regression analysis and the L2 norm is known from regression analysis and the L infinity norm is simply the maximum over all those absolute entries um, in your vector. So uh, absolute values x i. i. Okay, so that's, that's the L infinity norm. Let's do an example in MATLAB. Uh, we define our vector v as 2, 4, minus 1, 3 and we can then calculate the L1, L2 and the L infinity norm by um, calculating the function and evaluating the function norm v1, norm v2 and norm v inf. As you can see, the in L infinity norm is simply the maximum entry, absolute entry in this vector, which is 4. The L1 norm is uh, the sum of all those absolute values, 2 plus 4 plus 1 plus 3 yeah, that's 10, and this is the L2 norm, the Euclidean norm, where we need to calculate a little bit more in this case. We will usually use these norms, vector norms, and of course also any other norms, um, if we need an error metric, because we can now take the norm um, between two uh, vectors, uh, two results, two real numbers, for example, and we get what we call a metric, um, and the metric is simply the norm of the difference between two vectors, in other words, meaning the difference in the length or the location of those two vectors. So if the vectors, if the entries of the vector v are interpreted, for example, as an approximation error, the different norms will supply different error measures. For example, the sum of the absolute errors, that's the L1 norm, the root of the square root error root, uh, sum, that's the L uh, L2 norm, sorry, and the maximum error, that's the L infinity norm. Okay. And now we still need a matrix norm. We are looking at real matrices A. Um, they have to be quadratic. It only works for quad quadratic matrices. And a matrix norm is a function on the set of all real quadratic matrices, for which we have the following characteristics. Again, it has to be larger than zero for any matrix that's not the zero matrix. And the norm has to be zero for A equal to zero. If we multiply the matrix with a constant, you can take the constant with absolute value out of the norm for every constant. And again, a triangular in equation uh, A plus B, the norm of those two uh, matrices is smaller or equal than the norm of A plus the norm of B. So that's um, here a matrix norm. Some examples. The L infinity norm is the maximum of um, the sum of j equal to 1 to n over all those absolute entries, uh, but we are now going through the um, rows of the matrix. The L1 norm is actually the same, uh, just um, we are now going through all those columns. Um, the Frobenius norm uh, is defined as the sum over i and the sum over j of a i j squared in absolute terms, and then take the square root. And we also have the so-called spectral norm, which is the square root of the uh, spectral radius row of the matrix. And the spectral radius is the maximum absolute eigenvalue of the matrix. And you probably remember this from your linear algebra class in the first semester. We have a spectral norm, um, a spectral radius and eigenvalues of a matrix. Yeah. We then, last but not least, call a matrix and a vector norm compatible if the following applies. The norm of Ax is smaller or equal than the norm of A times the norm of X. So then, if this 
equation holds for all matrices and vectors, then we call those two compatible. We need this later on. So let's turn to the condition number of a matrix. Um, again, remember, we are looking for the solution of a system of linear equations, AX uh, equals B. And we are now disturbing the vector B by the term delta B. We are inserting a small error in B. And the solution of the system of linear equation will be also disturbed because we are not expecting that with erroneous um, input data and an erroneous vector B, we are not expecting to get the true solution X, but we will get X plus delta X. So in other words, A times delta X equals delta B and this leads us to delta x, so the disturbance in our solution we're looking for, equals a inverted times delta b. Delta b is given. If we have a disturbance, we can try to measure the error in our input data. And again, the condition number, the condition of a mathematical problem, tells us something about how a disturbance in the input data leads to an error in the output, in the solution. So this is why we are now looking for norms. Um, remember how the condition number is defined and actually what we get here is um, the um, relative error in the um, solution on the left side here, that's the relative error in the solution, is smaller or equal than the norm of A times the norm of the inverse of A times the relative input data error. In other words, this here is our condition number sigma. That's sigma, that's the condition number. And as you can see, we don't need any information on the input data error. If we are given a certain matrix A, we can immediately calculate the condition number of this matrix and, for example, in this case, for the solution of a system of linear equation, if A is in some sense not nice, if it has a high condition number, um, we can try our best and we get a high condition and any slight error in the vector B will be amplified by the matrix A and the result will be off by a lot. So that's the condition number of a matrix. The norm of A times the norm of the inverse of A. The higher the condition number is, the more the solution of a system of linear equation will be skewed and will be disturbed by the error in the input data in B. So that's the condition number. Okay. So let's exemplify this in MATLAB. We define a matrix A as 1, 0 0.6, 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 3, 2, 3, 2, 2, and we calculate the condition number. In this case, the condition is almost close to 30. Now let's use a three-dimensional Hilbert matrix, and you might remember from our first lecture that the Hilbert matrix is famous for being badly conditioned, having a very high condition number. And as it turns out, yes, actually it has a, almost, um, a condition number that is almost 10 uh, factor higher than uh, the condition number for a matrix A. So what to do now? Um, we need methods that deal with this in some way. Um, most popular direct method is probably Gaussian elimination. Uh, this is a direct method. Uh, we'll later on see why, what is direct and what is indirect, basically. Um, and you've probably learned this method and used this method already at school, and it includes the multiplication of A with a permutation matrix P. So you are ch changing rows, you're changing columns if necessary, and you remember this from school and maybe uh, the introduction to mathematics, that to solve the system of linear equation with Gaussian elimination, you have to be, uh, you have to know some tricks how to change the rows and columns uh, of your matrix. Um, in matrix notation, it means that actually you are trying to get something like this. P times A equals L times U. L is a lower and U is an upper triangular matrix, obere, untere, dreiecks matrix. Uh, and then you can actually, um, when you get such a decomposition, which we call an LU decomposition of the matrix A, then you can solve the system of linear equations. Now, 
Uh, let's do this in matrix, uh, in no, matrix, in MATLAB. Uh, we are using the matrix A, 1, 4, minus 2, minus 3, 9, 8, 5, 1, minus 6. And we use the um, MATLAB um, function LU of A, which gives you L and U, and also the, also the permutation matrix P, which was used to get this LU decomposition of A. So that's L, U, and P. Now, um, we can also get the following decomposition here. Again, um, if you see this here, if you take L, U, uh, and if you take L times U minus A, uh, what you get here is the, we would expect this to be zero because we said that A is decomposed into L times U. But as you can see here, MATLAB still has some rounding errors um, at the 15th um, decimal. And you get a slight error here and here, but we would say, okay, for MATLAB, for this computer, this is close to being the zero matrix, so this is fine. Okay, so the LU decomposition um, is, um, well, um, is um, Gaussian elimination. As one could see from the equation A equal to um, A equal to LU, this was not exactly satisfied in this case, and you can use the permutation matrix for reducing the error. Actually, in this case, we don't get any apparent influence, at least not with four decimals, um, but this is just the case here. It might have been that using the permutation matrix helps actually in reducing this slight error, so by shifting some rows and columns before, uh, you might get a slightly smaller error. Okay. Now, using the LU decomposition, you can easily solve a system of linear equations. We are trying to solve A times X equal to B, and you can solve it by an LU decomposition by um, first doing L times uh, Y equal to P times B, and then uh, calculating U times X equal to Y. So the solution of the SLE using Gaussian elimination is B, Let's assume this is 1, 2, 3. And actually, MATLAB does this with this operator, with this function here, a slash or backslash b. And you get the solution 1.082 and so on. So that's um, what you can do. Um, you can use the LU decomposition as well. So if you say x equals to u backslash parenthesis l backslash p times b, and then close the parentheses, you see you get, at least with four decimals, you get the same result. So solutions match at the chosen number of digits. Now we can ask ourselves what the advantage of the solution of an SLE by the LU decomposition is. Uh, and we look at the following program. So this is actually Gaussian elimination here. And LU decomposition is slightly more sophisticated. So let's see what happens when we are comparing the two, uh, which give the same result, at least in MATLAB. Let's see what happens um, when we are timing the two algorithms. We first of all generate um, random 100 times 100 matrix A. So A is rand 100, 100. And we then solve 1000 random systems of linear equations with the help of Gaussian elimination. We start the timer. This is quite easy in MATLAB. It's tick tock. So for i equal to 1, 2000, b equal to rand 100, comma 1, and x equal to a slash or backslash b, uh, we are timing now the solution of 1000 random um, systems of linear equations. And the elapsed time on this computer was 1 0.04 seconds. So one second. Okay, let's do this with the LU decomposition and we can do the LU comp decomposition before. And actually, as you can see here, if you already have the LU decomposition and you do the same again, but now solve the system of linear equations, uh, the systems of linear equations with the LU decomposition, actually the Gaussian elimination is 100 times slower than the DLU decomposition. So you have a huge uh, computational advantage when you use the LU decomposition in contrast to uh, Gaussian elimination. And this is a huge advantage 
of the LU decomposition. This is why, at least if you're doing it on a computer, not on a sheet of paper, you should use the LU decomposition. Okay. This is a direct method. Now, we're not calling them indirect methods, but in contrast to direct methods, we can also use iterative methods, in which case we are looking for an iteration sequence xn, for example, a vector, a solution vector, that slowly or hopefully quickly converges to um, our solution. Now, theoretically, the method can be continued infinitely, so xn, x5, x5000, x10,000, but you would assume that at some point, for example, if we show it like this, we would say that at some point it will circle around your solution and then that's uh, the solution. Hmm? So it converges. Okay. Now we have two methods um, that will be presented here. The relative simple uh, Gauss-Jacobi method um, um, no, actually only Gauss-Jacobi method. Um, there are also other more sophisticated methods, for example, Gauss-Seidel and also the SOR method. They are usually more advantageous for problems with sparse matrices. Those are matrices where you have, f it's a huge matrix, you have few numbers that are not zero and the whole matrix is uh, virtually consists of zeros. That's a sparse matrix. So for these methods, or actually for these problems, you have slightly different methods like the SOR method, but uh, we'll not be talking about these here. Uh, they are usually very interesting in supply chain management and optimization. So let's talk about the Gauss-Jacobi method. Um, the Gauss-Jacobi method again assumes a system of linear equations AX equals B, and it's given with A equal to D plus C and D being a diagonal matrix. Uh, this is the main diagonal of A, and the system of linear equations is then equivalent to D times X equals minus CX plus B. So the idea of the Gauss-Jacobi method is simply to say, okay, let's move D, invert it, and put it on the right side, and X N plus 1 equals minus D, inverted, times CX in the previous step, plus D inverse uh, times b. And the iteration sequence converges, converges, not convergences, um, converges provided that the spectral radius of the matrix minus d inverted c is smaller than that one. This is where we need the spectral radius actually. I'm not proving it, but uh, you need to know the spectral radius of this matrix and then it converges or it doesn't converge. So let's do this in a small MATLAB example. The function um, gives you as results x and i. It's called Jacobi. We need a, we need b, a starting vector x0, an epsilon or a maximal number of iterations. So let's say 1000 iterations or a s epsilon so that we can see um, xn and xn plus 1 do not change relative to um, um, a certain threshold. And the rest is quite clear. DA is the diagonal, a main diagonal of A. C equals A minus the diagonal matrix of DA. D inverse is the diagonal matrix of 1 divided by all those diagonal entries. Quite clear. D is a diagonal matrix, so you can invert it quite easily by taking the inverse of all those diagonal entries. Uh, B is minus D inverted times C. B1 is D inverted times B. Old x is initialized, initialized sorry, with x0, and then we have a for loop from 1 until the maximum number of iterations. x is b times old x plus b1. We've actually included this here before the for loop so that it does not need to be calculated in every step of the for loop. This is just efficient programming. And if the norm of x minus old x is smaller than epsilon, times the norm of old x, break, stop it, or otherwise you go until the maximum number of iterations, and then you reset old x equal to x and calculate a new one. And that's the algorithm. And if we now compute it here, we are using a1, a2, two matrices, b, and we assume for a moment that MATLAB gives us the exact solution using Gaussian elimination, um, 
um, here with exact one, exact two, a1 backslash b, a2 backslash b. And then let's see um, how the Jacobi um, iterative method works for a1 and a2. And we start with the zero vector as the initialization. So x1 is actually perfect, near perfect. You can see that after 41 iterations, we got the solution right at least with four decimals. So we got the same result as Gaussian elimination. With x2, it's it stopped after the maximum number of iterations had run out and the result is a disaster. Well, you can imagine what happened. Go back to the slide here. We probably should have looked at the spectral radius of the matrix minus d inverted times c. And this is what happened here. You can see um, that actually if you calculate the spectral radius, you need to take the eigenvalues, which is given by Eich uh, in MATLAB, and the maximum absolute eigenvalues. You can see here for the first matrix A1, the convergence condition is fulfilled. In the second case, it's just slightly above one and it will not converge. So that's why we got um, a woefully inaccurate result here in X2 and a pretty good result in X1. So that's the case here. Okay, so this is um, our discussion of solving a system of linear equations. You can use Gaussian elimination, that's A backslash B. Uh, you can use the LU de decomposition, which should give you the same result, but much quicker. And you can use an iterative method. Uh, in some cases, this might uh, be more convenient, um, but uh, this is the first example of an iterative uh, method and um, that can be used to solve such an SLE. And in the next chapter, in the next lesson, we'll start with the capital asset pricing model and um, our discussion of portfolio optimization using optimization methods um, and convex optimization um, in the context of portfolio theory. Um, and if you have any questions, Please stay in the Zoom room and we can discuss your questions. Otherwise, thank you very much for your attention and see you next week.